This show is sponsored by IdealWorkspace.com, which promotes a healthier way of working through their adjustable standing desk. Check out their latest smart adjustable standing desk at Altizen.com. A-L-T-I-Z-E-N.com. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business, technology and media in Asia. In this episode, I speak to Helen Dush and Uma Tana Balasingam from Lean in Singapore. We discuss the Lean in movement in Singapore and their interaction with their counterparts in the rest of Asia, and at the same time examine the challenges and perspectives on women and their leadership progress in the workplace. Hi he- Helen. Hi Uma. Hi Bernard. Hello. Hi. How are you both doing? We're great. Yeah, we're good. Thank you. Yes, and I'm talking to Helen Deuce, Managing Partner, Green Ocean Group, and Uma Tana Balasingam, who's currently the Vice President, Channel and Sales of Riverbed Technology. And what is interesting is that both are co-founders of Lean In Singapore. So before that, I wanted to get to know both of you better. And I would also want to thank Charles Anderson for actually getting us connected to make this interview possible. And I definitely would like to help in championing women's causes across Asia. I want to start to get to know both of you better. Maybe I'll start with Helen first. How did you start your career? Uh, so I started my career a very, 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 very long time ago. <laughs> so about only 25 years ago, I started with Unilever. I was an, a marketing person. I've been in marketing for for most of my career. So in the UK, working for Unilever, I was with them for about 15 years. And then I moved to the MIT Auto ID Center and worked for a couple of years at a Cambridge University, leading a research center. And then moved to work in a, a global marketing consultancy. So with a, a bunch of ex-Unilever colleagues, we founded a global marketing agency. And I worked there again for another 10, 12 years. That was sold a couple of years back to WPP. And uh, since then, I've been uh, working for Green Ocean Group. You also have done your EMBA in INSEAD as well, right? As I understand from your background. Yeah, that's right. I did that. I moved to Singapore six years ago and discovered that there was an INSEAD campus right on the doorstep. So I took advantage of that and did an executive MBA. And I graduated from there in 2013. Just a quick one. You're currently the managing partner of Green Ocean Group. I understand it's something to do with sustainability and impact. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, it's a consultancy that's really about business for good. So it's working with big multinationals, trying to help them find ways that they can grow profitably through doing good business. So supporting social causes or environmental causes. And, and equally, I work with, on the other side, with NGOs who are looking for more sustainable sources of funding and looking for building sustainable business models. So I sort of like bridge the gap, if you like, between the NGO world and the business world, which fits quite well with, with Lean In because Lean In obviously is this great cause around gender balance. So for me, that's part of business for good. So throughout your career journey, what are the interesting career lessons you can share with my audience then? Okay, so... I think there's sort of three things that I've, I've learned. I think all very pertinent to, to most women, and maybe some men as well. I don't know. You can tell me. The first is, is to make sure that you ask for what you want. I think often there's been times in my career where I've just thought if I put my head down and work really hard and do a really good job and deliver on the results, then good things will happen. And of course, good things do happen. But sometimes you've also got to be very clear with people what you want And I think being very clear as early in your career and as often as possible about what the things are that you want and what you're looking for, I think really helps. And sometimes we forget to ask. Sometimes we just hope that things will happen. So that's the first lesson. The second is about having what I call a personal board. So it's having a group of people who help and advise you along the way. And again, it's something that I didn't do earlier in my career. And I look back and I'm not sure why, but I realize now this benefit of having mentors and people who really champion and support you and just give you really good, solid advice. And I, I now have a personal board of people that I use. And I wish I'd I've done that earlier. I wish I'd learned that earlier in my career. And then the final thing I think is, is definitely you know, a, a hard lesson learned over the years. And that is to sweat the small stuff in terms of gender inequalities. So there are a lot of situations and uh, incidences, uh, you know, throughout my career where I, I got treated differently because I was a woman or, or, or behavior was inappropriate. And I never said anything. I always felt that that would make me seem like I was difficult or that it would get in the way of my career progression. So I sort of swallowed a lot of stuff and was very tolerant. And it was only when I became a boss and started having a team of, of people and, and some of those those people were women that I realized my not addressing, you know, 
bad behavior actually was was not good for for the next generation of women so i think if i was to go back and do it again you know i would definitely be less tolerant and and try and be braver and try and find ways that i could address gender imbalance and gender inequality rather than just sort of sucking it up and thinking well i'm okay you know i can deal with it and and not perhaps uh, playing it forward as much so those are my three sort of career lessons thank you helen and i'm coming to you now uma can you talk about how do you start your career Sure. So my first job was in Malaysia. I started as a systems engineer. I studied computer science in university and in Malaysia, if you're a Malaysian, when you apply for local universities, they choose what you get and I really got my fifth choice, which is computer science. So I grew to love technology from there and from there I progressed into a sales role in IBM and then moved to Singapore about 11 years ago to take a Southeast Asia sales position with a company called Brocade and then moved to EMC now known as Dell EMC so I worked there for almost 8 years and then about a year ago started at Riverbed Technology Specifically can you talk about your current role and coverage with Riverbed Technology Sure so I'm responsible for go to market and route to market across Asia Pacific and Japan Riverbed at its core is an application performance company so we produce end to end solutions around application performance over networks for our customers we do that through optimization visibility software defined edge etc so my role is really to together with my team defining the best way to take our products to market through a wide variety of channel ecosystem and that includes service provider global system integrators distribution etc throughout your career journey what are the interesting career lessons you can share with my audience as well yeah so quite similar to Helen probably my first lesson and it's really how i got my first job is about having your network So I scored my first interview in that first job because of a roommate that I shared a room with and her sister worked in IBM and you know the sister happened to know about this general manager of an IBM business partner that was looking for a systems engineer and that's how I got the interview and got the job. My second lesson which also happened in my first job is what Helen said about asking. I remember in that interview that first interview as he offered me my job and i remember he said how much he was going to pay me and i really wanted to have my own room for a change in my and move out and i said to him well you know you need to pay me 400 ringgit more and he just looked at me and he said okay then and that was my first lesson in ask and you shall receive <laughs> the third is probably as i moved into you know being a people manager and then the leader is always hire people that are smarter than you and while we talk about diversity today which will be a big content over discussion today i think diversity in thinking is also very important and the fourth is probably around mentorship i don't think i would be here or i would have gotten here as quickly if i didn't have great mentors and sponsors they were certainly responsible for accelerating my career in fact one of them is directly responsible for me to meet Helen and co-founder in Singapore and the last is just having that circle so it's throughout my career just having friends both male and female that are there to support you for you to bounce ideas with to kind of you know prod you forward and put your hand up for things that maybe you think you don't deserve or are qualified for yet So which comes to the main topic of the day we are going to talk about lean in and also the Singapore chapter as well explore some of the topics on about women leadership in Asia. So as an introduction and I have actually read the book Lean in by Sheryl Sandberg who is currently the chief operating officer of Facebook and then also a board member of Disney in her famous TED talk that is actually translated into a book called Lean in. Can either of you briefly describe the concept of lean in as pioneered by her? Yep, sure. So, as you mentioned, Sheryl Sandberg wrote the book Lean In in 2013 and it's really encouraging women to embrace challenge and risk in the workplace. So, she talks about the challenges that women face in trying to get ahead and how we should really take charge and how we can do it of our own careers and push forward at a time when gender bias is more alive and well than most of us may want to admit. So, off the back of that is the start of leanin.org, which obviously also founded by Cheryl, and that's an online community that's dedicated to helping all women achieve their ambition. The concept is really at its core of leanin is what we call leanin circles. 
And that's small peer groups of between 8 to 12 women who meet regularly to share and learn together. So it's peer-to-peer support. And Lean In Chapters, like the Lean In Chapter in Singapore, is a collection of circles and individual members that come together a few times a year to share, network, and focus on educational and inspirational topics. So how did you both end up starting the chapter of Lean In Singapore together then? So the, the journey started for me, I guess, about three years back, when I actually when I was at INSEAD. So there were very few women, and we, we realized after the first few months that we were never actually going to get to work together because when they put us into groups, they would sort of divide the women up amongst the men so there was one woman per group. So we decided, okay, well, you know, if we're not careful, we're not going to get to know each other very well. So I started a lean-in circle with, with the women on my INSEAD course. And we would meet each other's homes and we would sit and talk. And I got a really great benefit out of this this circle of women. I really found that, you know, it was what what we call tough love. You know, they were challenging and inspiring. And even though we're from different countries and different backgrounds, their advice was really, really helpful and their mentorship was really helpful. So when I went to start this small circle of of 10 women, I noticed that there wasn't a chapter. So I thought, okay, well, I'll just start a chapter just so that there is a chapter in Singapore. And then over the space of about six months, every time somebody wanted to join the chapter, they have to send me like a little email. I get a little email popping in my inbox. And there were about, after six months, there was maybe 245 emails from women saying, this is a great movement. I'm really looking for, uh, for support. And meeting other like-minded women and so when it got to that stage I thought well I better do something with it so at that point this was March of 2016 I hosted my first event in Seattle very kindly hosted us and I invited everybody who'd signed up to the, the chapter and about 100 women turned up you know I introduced what Lean In was and said look I, I don't know how to do this I think it's important but I really need some help and so I asked people to just give me their cards if they were interested in helping and Uma was one of the many women who handed in their cards and I just randomly pulled out and selected like four or five of these women out of you know maybe 50 60 business cards to help and Uma was one of them and she's immediately we realized that we shared the same why and we were very passionate about the same things and she puts as much energy enthusiasm and time into it as I do so it's been a really strong partnership since then. Uma do you want to mention talk about how you ended up being in the room? (laughs) Yeah so Ironically, I mean, I, I guess a lot of people talk about how, you know, when you envision something to happen, how the universe comes together to make that happen for you. So I met Helen at the Cincinnati event a week after my mentor asked me, if you had all of the money and time in the world, what would you do? And while, you know, it's been always in my head to do something, you know, I said to him, I would help women progress in the workplace. And coincidentally, the INSEAD event popped up on my Gmail and I showed up. We didn't actually meet to speak till maybe a couple of weeks later. And yeah, I guess the rest is history. We're over (laughs) a thousand members now since then. The very next day after I met Helen, I started leaning women in tech, which is now almost half of the chapter. And so, yeah, it's just been a whirlwind, but I think a very enriching experience for both of us. Yeah. So you have both talked about how the concept of leaning and also the leaning circles and how it actually helped women to actually discuss some of the, their own issues, uh, seeking mentorship help with the movement itself. Can you talk a bit more about what are the key objectives of the leading movement globally and specifically in Singapore? Are there any difference that may be taken into account of cultural? Sure. So at a global level, Essentially, the key objective is to create a level playing field. And we, still, you do, we do that through a, a few ways. One is the concept of what we talked about earlier, which is leaning circles. So having that peer-to-peer support. Two is to move more females into leadership positions. We do that through inspiration, through support, through education of the sticky floor. And sticky floor is really when women have limiting beliefs that hold themselves back from career growth, whether that means promotions or special projects, putting their hand up essentially. And we do that in Singapore specifically. We inspire, equip, empower, that's our mission, women in Singapore, to fulfill their career ambitions and lead successful, happy lives. 
We have very ambitious goals as part of our objectives. In the next five years in Singapore, we hope to raise the percentage of women in senior management roles. Today, senior managers and above, it hovers around 25%. So no female senior managers in companies. We hope to reduce that to 5%. And we hope to increase women in senior manager positions and above from 26% to 40%. We know that doing all of this in any business, diverse team brings a lot to the table. We have endless data that shows diverse teams make better decisions. Companies and teams perform better. They're more innovative. They bring in more revenue and profit. So it's in the interest of everyone to do this. Singapore today ranks on the World Economic Forum on the Global Gender Gap Report, number 55. Part of our ambitious aspiration is to move them up to top 10. In Southeast Asia, they're number five. We hope that doing this will raise them up to number uh, number one. There's a very interesting set of measurable numbers that you are thinking of achieving with the linear movement itself. So just one question, what are the activities do the chapter typically get together? And does the chapter also extend this invitation to other chapters within Asia? Yes. So at a chapter level, it's really focused on sort of bigger events where we bring together people who are already in a circle and people who aren't in a circle either because they don't want to join a small circle or because they haven't met the right people yet to form one. And so these events, we do somewhere between four and six a year, although we seem to be increasing rapidly the number we do, just really out of demand. We're hosted by companies across Singapore, people who offer, you know, offer us the space and, and refreshments and work with us to, to bring people together. So we've, we've done events with Zada, with Uber, with Cisco and, and with INSEAD to mention Fu and Edelman was, was another one. And these events, what we try and do is give women the experience of what it's like to be in a circle. So rather than, you know, just coming and sitting and listening and seeing, you know, fantastic role models, which is important because that inspiration is important, we try and move beyond that to get them to think about what can they do right now that will help move their career objectives forward. So we're all about them feeling empowered and feeling equipped to make the change they need to make. So typically what an event will look like is we will share a piece of content, whether it's about negotiations or whether it's about unconscious bias, and then we break the room into smaller groups with a moderator, and they go off and they have like a mini circle discussion. And this allows them to have really deep, authentic conversations and to end the session with one or two immediate actions. So they're leaving feeling really inspired, but also equipped to make some change. For us, what's important is we don't, it's very easy to get depressed and go, oh my gosh, it's terrible. And I'm not going to be able to change it until I'm the CEO of a company. And actually, there's a lot of things that we can all do right now. So it's really important to us that our events are authentic and they're empowering and that women leave really inspired and equipped to make change. We do work with the rest of the, with other chapters across Asia. So there's a regional Asian group with a, the Malaysian team are very well organized and been around for a long time. And they coordinated this Asian event. And we met there with the other chapters from China, from India, from Thailand, from Japan, to name a few. And we collectively try and get together and share best practice so we're not all reinventing the wheel. So, yeah, there is this sort of movement across Asia. We also, you know, there's lots of different movements within Singapore, lots of different women's movements who all do great work. And where possible, you know, we work and you know, we cooperate and work with other women's groups because we think the more the merrier, the more people working in this space, the better for Singapore. I'm going to turn the conversation into talking a lot about women leadership in Asia itself. I guess the first thing I want to ask, compared to US and Europe, for specifically for Asia, what are the key challenges for women in the workplace? So there are probably a lot of common themes. It's a very loaded question and, you know, there are lots of challenges. I'm going to try and just in no particular order talk about a few. So we know about the glass ceiling and that's really the unacknowledged barrier of uh, advancement in profession. So women getting to frontline roles in leadership positions. And then Helen mentioned unconscious bias, which is a big part of what we do at our events. And that's really stereotyping of genders that, you know, results in influencing decisions in a manner that we're unaware. So that too comes in play. The first is probably equal pay. And we know this is 
globally a challenge. So it's 2017, women still make less than men. Ministry of Manpower actually acknowledges that the gender wage gap has not closed in Singapore since 2006, although Singapore is making great strides, is considered leading in terms of closing the wage gap, but leading doesn't mean it's complete. So we still have ways to go before men and women reach parity in terms of workplace compensation. The second, and I guess maybe more pronounced recently, especially in male-dominated industries, is harassment. So getting more airtime for specific companies in Silicon Valley, that results in women potentially getting into depression, anxiety. Most women quit. You know, a lot of women don't report today, but we're seeing more women become vocal about it. So it still remains a widespread problem globally. The third is around career opportunities. So the 2016 Women in the Workplace study talks about you know, access to special projects, for example, for women. That despite women negotiating for promotion and raises as often as men, they are likely to get more pushback when they do. Women get offered fewer high visibility or mission critical roles, etc., that enables them to reach higher level of leadership, access to special projects, etc. The fourth is the maternal wall. So the combination of having a successful career but also having children as well. And then the fifth, flexible work arrangements. We see a lot of companies today, you know, as part of the Leaning Diversity and Inclusion Award in Tech Accelerate Asia that we're partnering with in October. You know, we saw a few tech companies come in and talk about in their submission, talk about what they're doing to provide working flexibility. So, and really these companies are focusing on productivity and results versus time spent on a desk. And the last I would say is role models and sponsorship. So there's a difference between mentorship and sponsorship, mentors advice, sponsors act. And when it comes to mentors, you know, and having role models, that's really key for women. So you can't be what you can't see. And for sponsorships, you know, that's really about visibility. We need, you know, more successful executives, especially men, to give visibility to successful women, talk about their accomplishments, and promote them for stretch opportunities. And so those are broadly the key challenges. I would say they're mostly globally consistent. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about Asia soon. The interesting point that you brought up is about unconscious bias. And I guess it is something that actually we should just watch out pertaining to our workplace. Truth be told, when I took over my team in my current role in St. Paul's, the team was actually 100% men senior officers and zero women senior officers. It took me about three years to actually get into a 50-50 percentage because I have this view that you need a diverse point of views in order. To, and also the same thing is that we also have junior officers who actually require women role models and having the women senior officers actually help to bring them scale up as, at the same time as well. So I think when I even the way how I interact with HR, I get to see these kinds of unconscious bias. You talk about the maternal wall. In fact, they will look at the CVs and then they say, okay, why this woman has not been in the working for one year? That may be because they are t- taking time out to actually look after their children. So I try to take away those filters out from the CV as part of it. So can you talk a lot more about this concept of unconscious bias that most people should watch out. I think it, I think it's actually much more prevalent in men than other people that I've seen that actually have these kind of biases. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, the research suggests that the unconscious bias is equally shared by men and women. We're, we're both very susceptible to it. When we look at, you know, there's great strides made in gender ba- balance, uh, you know, since, you know, in the last 100 years. But in the last sort of 10, 15, that, that's changed. It's really stalled. And so there's a lot of like digging around thinking, well, what has happened? Why are we suddenly reached this, this point where we don't seem to be progressing as fast, as quickly as we were before? There's, I guess there's the old fashioned sort of mad men type of sexism. And often I think the academics call that first generational sexism, you know, where it's very overt and people making inappropriate comments and, and just, you know, out and out sexism. For the most part, that, that sort of behavior has disappeared. And what's left is this second generational sexism, which is these deep unconscious biases that we all have. And essentially how it plays out is, you know, if you say surgeon, firefighter, CEO, most of us have a mental model of a man. Right? A picture of a man comes into our mind. 
Um, and if we say you know, receptionist, secretary, teacher, nurse, we have a mental picture most often, most of us of a woman. And that's fair enough. We can all understand that that's part of our, you know, the social context in which we've been brought up. It's, and it's not, you could argue, it's not such a problem. We don't, you know, if we meet a woman who's a surgeon, we don't sort of fall apart. We can sort of, our brains are able to cope with this. But what happens is when we come across something that doesn't quite fit with a, a, a deep mental model, is our brain does a double take. And it might only be like a fraction of a second and it might be completely unconscious, but we take a second look. And in that moment, what plays out is a lot of biases that then uh, affects our ability to treat men and women the same. So what will happen is, you know, you were talking about CVs and taking off, you know, looking twice at the, at the gender of, the, of a CV. What happens is, is we say, okay, here's a surgeon who's a woman. Hmm, that's interesting. I'm going to go and check and see if I can understand why, you know, this, is, this doesn't fit with my mental model. And in doing that checking, we end up looking for more proof that they're competent. We end up having a higher expectations or higher criteria for them. And that plays out, you know, across many different aspects. And this is one of the things that really is holding women back. And as I said, the research shows both men and women have the, these biases. We're just not aware of them. So for us sort of like raising awareness and getting us to be aware of the fact that, you know, we're, we're biased is a really key to the work we do. And that's why in most of our events, we spend a lot of time sort of talking about this and trying to help people see their blind spots. So what are your advice to women in how they should approach practical things like taking on a more senior role with regards to career advancement or asking for a raise? So probably three things come to mind. First is to ask, you know, you heard earlier that we both said that was part of our learnings, you know, respective careers. You know, I think women really need to be bold, lean in, right? And you got to first help yourself before others can help you, you know, understand how unconscious bias plays out, educate yourself about it, read, lean in. You know, we know that, for example, women get vague feedback. Part of your action should be to ask for explicit feedback when you do that review of performance with your boss. The second is to plan. We know that women are generally, you know, judged on performance and men on potential. And so one example of what you can do is to document your success and document your work so it's visible. You know, especially relevant when you get new managers. Based on my experience, you got to, you know, you start ground zero. Like women constantly have to prove themselves. And so documenting the work that you do and the success that you contribute to is really important. And as part of that, it's really important for women to take credit which we don't do often or well enough. We do many great work, but we usually contributed to being in the right place at the right time, that we had a lot of help, etc. So take credit. And lastly, circles, which is the you know at the core of the concept of lean in, where you know build your circle of peer-to-peer -peer support with a group of women where you can learn together. You can support each other where, you know, you're each going to take personal actions. You hold each other accountable to your career goals and then also celebrate each other as you navigate the jungle gym, as Cheryl calls it. So how does men, who is the other 50 percent, able to help women to advance from the home to the workplace? So um, I think we need more men like you, Bern. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm far from no, being No, we, we need, we need, you know, there's this term he for she, but we need men who, are, who are, are aware of the issue, are passionate about it and are prepared to sort of champion because you're right, you know, men are half of the solution. And, you know, we recognize that while we bring women together and we talk to women that we're only talking to half of the, the, the solution. So we have done a he for she event where we brought men together and with women to talk about this. So I think the first thing is, is, is just for men to be aware that this happens and to be aware of their own unconscious bias and, and those of people around it. And I think we can make great strides just by raising the awareness. The second thing I think that, that men can do is they can, there's this concept in, you know, in the lean in movement of having your, of having a posse. So having like a group of people in work who have your back and recognize that, you know, women get interrupted more often, their ideas don't get heard. So they'll come up with a great idea, it will be ignored, a man will then repeat it and it will get recognized. So it's 
being aware of that and when that happens, stepping in and saying, oh, that was a great idea when she said it or to let the lady finish what she was saying rather than interrupting her. So playing that role of, of being you know, part of posse that makes sure that unconscious bias isn't allowed to, to manifest itself in the workplace. And then the, the third thing is, and I think it's for, for the guys out there who are, who are married and feminists, it's really, you know, playing a bigger role at home because, uh, you know, Cheryl says in the book, the biggest choice a feminist makes is the man she marries because, you know, like if my husband's not prepared to do, take on half a workload with the kids, then I don't have that time that I, I need to put into my career. So it's really, you know, making sure that you, you do half of your fair share of the homework so that you know, your female counterpart has got, the, you know, has got more time to be able to lean into her career. So in your experience within Asia, do you see women encounter the same kind of challenges as their counterparts in the US and Europe? I, I think I've actually talked about this a little while earlier. Are there any specific cultural differences? Yeah, so we had a quick chat this morning over coffee and Helen has, you know, you've been working in all three, well, you have worked in all three continents. And I think we both agree that they're exactly the same. You know, the role of gender is deeply ingrained globally, and which is why the lean in movement is gaining traction globally, because the issues are relevant to all, you know, men take charge, women take care. And when it comes to Asia, we have deep cultural roots and it differs from Japan to Pakistan. So we have traditional values that still linger in most household and workplaces in Singapore, for example, that causes severe disparity in gender division and labor. The values taught to us, certainly for me, growing up in Malaysia as young ladies was gracefulness, compassion, graciousness, gratitude. Right? We're constantly reminded of our future responsibilities for the household, obligations towards our future husbands. So you find most female professionals are often expected to hire a maid given affordability, et cetera, in Singapore to run the household. You know, Singapore specifically, right, has enjoyed fabulous growth. It's heading towards being a smart nation with billions of dollars of investment. It's going to need the input of half of the nation. And we have a lot of work to do through protection of accommodative policies, business practices, working with companies to set targets, for, you know, how they conduct performance assessments, all of that in, you know, fully neutralizing this. One interesting issue that came out is that actually culture is really not making any difference. I think I, I have this thought shared with Helen previously during our coffee is that when we talk about some of these uh, women leaders we know, we tend to Few, and sometimes I think men use that as an excuse to say that oh, they are women leaders. But actually, if you look at the actual statistic, they are the exception and not the norm. And there is this, and they try to massage that bias out. And am I right to say that across the world, even with Asia, is actually you still need more women to actually step up and get onto the leadership of whether it's business, politics, or or even social causes as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So I mean, the statistics play out that globally, uh, women in sort of leadership as in C-level situations is about 17%. 17%. In Singapore, it's about 8%. So there's, there's, there's quite a gap to go globally and, and, and in Singapore. What we know about Singapore, though, is that when it sets its mind to something, you know, this country can achieve anything. And they're very, very active in this space. There's a, there's a group called DAC, the Diversity Action Committee, who've written this fabulous report, extremely detailed, goes company by company and shows where the challenges are and really action orientated. So we feel like super we feel like we're in the right time at the right place. You know, the while you're talking to, you know, a Brit and a Malaysian, the majority of the chapter are Singaporean women. And there's just generally a very positive sense that this is the right time, that, you know, everything is, momentum is all in our favour. But you're right, the numbers aren't there yet, but, but and there's work to be done, but we feel really confident that, especially in Singapore, that we can make some great strides forward. Yeah, it all starts with having a dialogue and being transparent and open and just, you know, acknowledging that we have work to do. I mean, the fact that we have to say female leaders versus just leaders, <laughs> right? That's a great quote from Cheryl. It says, you know, in the future, there will just be leaders instead of female leaders. 
you know, acknowledges that we have an issue at hand. So we have seen recently male CEOs, venture capitalists and senior executives being outed for sex- sexual harassment and even assault in some cases coming from Silicon Valley and of course uh, other parts of the United States. What are your perspectives on this? Yeah, it's- so it's interesting because you asked the question about is there a difference between you know Asia and the rest of the world? I think there's more differences between industries, and I think when you get these industries that are very male dominated, you tend to have you know greater number of issues than you do in other industries that have managed to get a better gender balance. I mean, luckily we're seeing less and less of this old-fashioned nasty sexism. Um, it still does every now and then raise its head, but the great thing is is when it does. There's such a strong movement now, you know, one, it's instantly, you know, the whole world hears about it. And two, everybody instantly moves into action. So there's no, there's really no room for this behavior anymore. There's no, there's nowhere for it to hide. It's outed quickly and it's, it's sorted out quickly. For our point of view, what's challenging about this is, is that we want to have a dialogue. We want men to be comfortable talking about the issue and we want women to be comfortable talking about the issue together. And when these sort of like big headline events happen, what tends to happen is this big sort of name and shame culture where it's, oh, this company is terrible because this happened. And all dialogue gets closed down. And, you know, we think, you know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And when something happens like that, it's an opportunity, a really great opportunity to step in and really say, okay, right, clearly something's not right here. What can we do to help change it? And so we feel that, you know, we don't want to vilify companies when we see this sort of behavior. That's the time for us to, to offer to come and step in and, and try and help. Because unless we can get this dialogue going, we're, we're not going to move forward because we don't have all the answers. I mean, it's it's a tricky subject. I and mean, you and I talked about it, Bernard. I was talking to my husband about it. And he says to me, so what's the difference between good old, you know, like having banter and joking with women at work versus harassment versus sexual discrimination? It's a really gray area and there's no, there's no sort of handbook or right or wrong answers in this gray, I mean, the overt overt sexism, yes, but there's stuff in the middle. It's really murky and the only way we're going to resolve it is if we get comfortable talking about it in a way that women aren't defensive and men don't, don't shut up, that they engage in the conversation. So we worry about these big headline things because they stop that conversation happening. They make people very nervous and people don't want to sort of lean in to have the conversation and try and make meaning together. So wherever possible, we, you know, we keep coming back to this concept of the circles of getting people together. Yeah. We've just, we decided that we, we need a he for she chapter and Bernard, we think you should lead it. We think you should start a he for she chapter in Singapore mm-hmm. and we'll get Patrick to join you and all the other great men in our network because we think we, this dialogue is super important. Yeah, so our perspective is it's a shame, but each time it happens, it's an opportunity for us to step in and to begin to make some change. And one thing I do also realize that such crises actually also make a lot of men step back. They are actually afraid to even discuss it because one interesting perspective of the dialogue that you talk about, which I actually wholeheartedly agree with your approach, is actually to give that psychological safety to the men and the women within that room to actually talk about it and actually not trying to castigate or even trying to do a witch hunt and just to actually get these issues actually uh, discussed out improper. Yeah, we absolutely agree with you. And our He for She event was one of the best events we've run so Mm -hmm. far. The dialogue in the room and the energy in the room was amazing. And, you know, people said it's the first time they've really been able to sit and talk honestly without fear of being judged, without being defensive. And that's how we're going to make change. Yeah. And that's probably one of the things that we hold ourselves in all our own events, that we create a safe space for everyone to have the conversation. Like we get quotes after our events about, you know, how people have never seen an event where there's such openness and transparency and a sense of sharing and people coming together. So that's probably why I think we've just had a massive following and our success so far. And of course, a great set of volunteers that are behind us that mm-hmm. just makes everything happen. So Helen Wuma, thank you for coming on the show. But before that, we come to the closing. So I want to ask each one of you, can you recommend something which can be a book, movie, podcast, or anything else to my audience can learn something from? Okay, so for me, there are probably a couple of books that changed my career. One is a book called Magic of Thinking Big. It's from David Schwartz. I read it in my first job and just changed 
my lens on how to think. And the second is Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Just talks about all the successful people and the you know consistent pattern behind them. And then, of course, Hidden Figures is a great movie about four black women working in NASA um, in the 60s. And it's just a great movie to watch. A couple of other videos that have an impact that we use at our events. One is the McKinsey video. So you can search on it from the McKinsey Facebook site. And it's really a gender reversed video, which quite funny, but actually it's very true. So you see men playing the role of women and women and playing the role of men. And there's this great video from HP on fathers and daughters, where the fathers are looking at interview tips for women and you know it says things like you know don't speak too much and don't um, advertise yourself too much and they're just baffled by it so yeah how about helen yeah i'm i'm gonna be extremely biased and i just think that everybody should read the lean in book and watch the ted talk i think yeah so the, the the book i think for both men and women is a great start it's what i love about it is it's it's fact based and you know it's backed up with with research and data cheryl talks about her approach to life and it's very clear that it's not you know she's not suggesting that this is how other people should act you know there's this there's, there's things there was the way she behaves as a woman a woman in work that i totally get and there's there's ways that she works where i think well that's not for me that's not how i want to to lean into my career but it's really it's super inspirational and it's a, and it's a quick simple read that will really help people get beyond sort of their unconscious bias i actually have one recommendation and it's not a typical hollywood movie it's actually a bollywood movie called dangal starring amir khan who actually is a, a Indian actor that is like the Tom Cruise and he actually hosted this social talk show that actually helped to address inequality, uh, sexual inequality in India. And in the, the story of Dangal is actually about this male wrestler who became, was a national champion who couldn't make it to international and decided to train his daughters into wrestlers. And actually, uh, two, it's a real story and two of the daughters actually won an international gold medal. And one part of the story that actually attracts me the most was the part where the daughters didn't appreciate what he does until one of their best friends during a wedding said, uh, women are being married off at 14 to 15 and we don't even have a future. Your father is trying to give you all a future by that. So why aren't you doing it? And then the two daughters actually became really good at wrestling and they even out wrestled men as well. So, so I thought this would be a good movie because it's the same occasion we're talking about things about believing what you can do. So Helen and Uma, how can my audience find you? Okay, so we are on leanin.org. If you search for Singapore, you can find the Singapore chapter. If you search for women in tech Singapore, uh, if you're in tech, uh, that's how you'll find us. On social media, we're on Twitter at leaninsg, same with Instagram. And on Facebook and LeanIn, you can find us by Lean in Singapore. And how about yourselves? I actually managed to find both your Twitters and your LinkedIn too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I'm at Uma Tana and at Helen Ocean Green. Green Ocean. Green Ocean. <laughs> okay. Helen with Green, Green Ocean. Ocean. Yeah, I just have to make sure that you can be found too. And you can find me at bernalong.com. Uh, subscribe to us at Analyze Asia, A-N-A-L-Y-S-E Asia. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Acast, TuneIn, and of course, Google Play in the US market. Recommend us on Overcast with a star or even drop us a star on Pocket Cast. And of course, give us a five-star review in iTunes. And of course, be most importantly, drop me your feedback. So once again, Helen and Uma, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, Vera. Thank you so much. And congratulations on your newborn. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much.